I've been given the nod to get started. We've got a, a really full program for you tonight, so I don't want to waste any time. So welcome everybody to Menzies, to one of our public lectures. It's something that we take a real pride in, being able to showcase our research for you. My name's Tracy Dixon. I'm one of the deputy directors here at Menzies. Our director, Alison, is in the audience, but she's on leave. She'll give me a glare if I make a mistake, maybe. Put it in my performance management. But I really want to welcome everyone tonight to learn a little bit about our multiple sclerosis research. So to start proceedings tonight, I'd really like to start by acknowledging the Mahunana people, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which this campus was built. So many of you I know are returned performers or return attendees at our public lectures. But then, as you know, our mission at Menzies is to perform internationally significant medical research leading to a healthier, longer and better lives for Tasmanians. Sounds so simple when you say it like that, but of course it requires dedication, it requires teams, it requires multidisciplinary efforts, it requires really bright and switched on students. And that's what we're trying to do together. So our talks tonight not only focus on multiple sclerosis research and how it's developing, but how we're really working hard to translate this research into practice to ensure that it's really taken up by the community that we serve. We undertake this program that, of research that's ambitious with the crucial support of organisations such as MS um, Research Australia, the National Health and Medical Research Council and the Royal Hobart Hospital Research Foundation and of course the many members of the community that are supporters through philanthropy of Menzies and through giving up their time as volunteers also and participants in our many clinical studies and trials. So in addition to the three researchers that you're going to hear from tonight, you'll also hear from Mr Andrew Potter. He's a really knowledgeable advocate for MS research who knows firsthand the importance of research to people with MS and their families. So let me introduce our four speakers and then we'll jump into it. So one of the first speakers you're going to hear from tonight is Dr Kayleen Young. Dr Young has dedicated her career to studying the cellular processes underpinning neural plasticity and disease, including the study of immature stem cell populations in the brain. She completed her PhD at the Walter and Eliza Hall in Melbourne and was a postdoctoral research fellow at University College in London. In 2014, Kayleen was the co-recipient of the National Stem Cell Foundation of Australia Metcalf Prize for Stem Cell Research. The next speaker you'll hear from is Professor Bruce Taylor, who I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Professor Taylor is Professor of Neurological Research at Menzies and is a neurologist at the Royal Hobart Hospital. He's a medical graduate of the University of Tasmania and he completed his specialist training in neurology in Western Australia and at the Mayo Clinic in the US. He's part of numerous international research consortia in genetics and MS and has been involved in setting up of large cohort studies. The next speaker will be Associate Professor Ingrid Vandermeer. Associate Professor Vandermeer received her PhD in epidemiology from the University of Tasmania. She's now a principal research fellow here at Menzies and her work focuses on, on understanding why people get MS and what, influence it, and what influences its progression. She's managing director of the Australian MS Longitudinal Study and chief investigator of the primary progressive MS study and the MS Work Smart program. Finally tonight, you'll hear from Mr. Andrew Potter. Andrew was diagnosed with MS at the age of 23. He became an advocate for MS Australia in 2018, and in 2014, he became a co coordinator for the National Advocates Program. In May 2015, Andrew joined Oceans of Hope, a 67-foot yacht crewed, crewed by people with MS that has sailed around the world to inspire others with the condition. So I hope you can agree we have a really jam-packed program. You're going to hear about our MS research program, how it spans what we call the bench to the bedside, really from basic research, understanding the mechanisms of this disease, right through to how we make a change today to people who are living with MS. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Kayleen to the podium. Thanks very much. So as a scientist who studies MS, the aims of my research really are to develop new therapies that will improve the lives of people with MS, effectively neutralising the effect that the disease has on the body. Now, in order to think about the way ahead, which is the title of tonight's talk, and really think about where this direction should be going to really benefit 
um, equal and improve health outcomes. We really also have to think about, as, a, as scientists, how we view multiple sclerosis. For a really long time, it's been thought of as being an autoimmune disease, so a disease where the, uh, the nervous system attacks, oh, sorry, the immune system attacks the central nervous system, ultimately leading, leading to nervous system damage. And for this reason, a lot of research, like in the last 30 years, is focused on trying to understand what activates the immune system, why the immune system invades the, the nervous system to cause that damage. And that research has actually resulted in a large number of drugs that can modulate the immune response. And a lot of people with MS are now prescribed those drugs by the neurologist and are taking them quite routinely. But as part of that process, what we've realised is that actually even if you can modify the immune response, there is still some ongoing damage that happens to the nervous system. And so what I would really like to say to you is that we're really having to rethink uh, that, think about MS now as not just an autoimmune disease, but an autoimmune disease that also has an element of neurodegeneration. And that really shapes the direction that we're trying to take the research now moving forward. Um, and, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about the nervous system and the strategies that we're thinking about and that we're actually undertaking actively to try and develop new treatments that will specifically promote nervous system um, protection and nervous system repair. And so within the nervous system, the easiest way to think about it is basically as an electrical cable. It has three major cell types. One of those cell types are the neurons, and then the cells that carry the electrical information around the body, and they're effectively the electrical wiring. The other cell type are the oligodendrocytes, which are here, and they act to wrap up and insulate the nerve cells. It's their job to protect the nerve cells and allow them to rapidly and faithfully carry signals from one part of the nervous system to the other. The third major cell type are the astrocytes, and they effectively hold the whole thing together. Now, in multiple sclerosis, the first cells in the nervous system that are attacked and that die are the oligodendrocytes, so the insulating cells. And when they're lost, that insulation coming away from the nerves effectively slows down and sometimes blocks the ability of information to be carried appropriately in the nervous system. But actually, it's more than that. When they're lost for a prolonged period of time, they leave the neurons vulnerable. So eventually, what starts to happen is that the neurons themselves can, can be lost and can die. And this is what leads to progression in MS, when a person's um, disability starts to get progressively worse over time. And so the major aim of the research that we're trying to carry out is to intervene before this point and to target these oligodendrocytes so that we can replace them and in doing so, protect the really valuable um, nerve cells in the body, the neurons. And there are two different ways that we could go about this. One is to try and prevent the oligodendrocytes from dying in the first place. So we could spare them, we can rescue them from, from dying. The other way that we could do it is to make sure that we can really quickly replace them so that we don't leave the neurons vulnerable. Um, and so while my lab works on both of these aspects of, of the disease, trying to find new therapies that would come at it from both angles, today I'm really only going to talk to you about the second point, which is how oligodendrocytes can be replaced and the nervous system repaired. Um, and so when thinking about this question at the very beginning, I sort of thought, well, okay, if we want to replace oligodendrocytes, where are the cells going to come from to make a new oligodendrocyte? you need a cell that's going to turn into an oligodendrocyte. And this is where stem cell research is really um, paving the way for this. And a lot of the time when people think about stem cell research, they think about stem cells that are being put into the body. And for MS, a lot of this, that sort of strategy can be quite impractical because when a person has MS, they end up with areas of the brain where the oligodendrocytes die but it's not just one site in the brain. It's like multiple sites in the brain. It can also happen in the optic nerve, and it can happen in the spinal cord. So if you try to take stem cells and put them into each of those sites of damage, that's quite a lot of injection sites. And it, it's not exactly practical from a surgical point of view. 
So the approach that we're taking is to target cells that are already in our central nervous system. The cells in particular that my lab is targeting are called oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, or OPCs. Now, the wonderful thing about these cells is that they're already everywhere throughout our central nervous system. They're in our optic nerves <coughs> near our eye, they're in our spinal cord, and they're in our brain. And they basically make like a perfect <coughs> mosaic of cells across the, across the nervous system. And these are an immature stem cell type that really likes to make oligodendrocytes. It is what they are designed to do. Now, they have the capacity to divide and make new oligodendrocytes to add new insulation to the nervous system in our normal, healthy, day-to-day um, -day lives. And this is just an example of one of those cells that's been taken and put into a culture dish. And we've filmed it for 95 hours. And this has been really sped up, so we're not going to sit here for 95 hours. Um, it'll just take a minute. And what you see is that from one starting cell, it actually undergoes many divisions. And by the end of the movie, we have quite a large number of new cells. Now, each of those new cells can be oligodendrocytes. And it's really this potential of these cells that we already have in our nervous system that we really want to try and take advantage of and design ways to push these cells to, I guess, be activated in people with multiple sclerosis so that they can repair the oligodendrocytes and replace the oligodendrocytes that are lost. And so, just to show you, this is an example of one of the OPCs, the stem cells, and it's been filled with a dye so that you can see all of its little fine processes. And this is an example of one of the newly made oligodendrocytes that got added to the nervous system of, a, of an adult. And you can see here, this is the cell body. And each of these bars represents a piece of insulation that's been added to one of the nerve cells. So the other thing about these new oligodendrocytes is that one cell actually adds quite a lot of new insulation to, to its surrounding environment. And so I guess the thing is, this is what we want to do, but how do we get there? How do we make these OPCs stand up and do the job that we want them to do and make new replacement oligodendrocytes? So for the last five years, since I joined the Menzies Institute, I have been trying to understand the biology of these cells trying to understand what makes them become oligodendrocytes. And by understanding that biology, we now, ha we now have a way forward that we think can work therapeutically. And one of the things that we discovered during that time is that the largest signal, I guess the strongest signal, that the OPCs can respond to is an increase in the electrical activity of our own nervous system. And so what we thought would be a good way to approach this would be to find a way, like find a treatment that could increase the <coughs> level of healthy activity in our nervous system and therefore activate this stem cell population and cause it to make new oligodendrocytes. And so after thinking about this quite long and hard, the strategy that we decided to take was transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. Now, some of you may have heard of this as a treatment for depression. It's quite widely used in the clinic as a treatment of depression. But different applications of it can have different effects. And so what we wanted to do was try and take this treatment where you have a magnetic coil held over the person's head and it creates a magnetic field over the brain and that effectively massages or, and sort of heightens the level of, of electrical activity that's going on. But the pattern that it's applying is the sort of healthy, normal pattern of activity that's, that's happening in our nervous system all the time that it relies on to carry information. And so we're kind of, I guess, just supercharging it a little bit. And what we found when we actually applied this in preclinic, in the, in the laboratory, in a preclinical situation, was that it rapidly increased the number of new oligodendrocytes being added to the nervous system. So it was very successful in activating the OPCs, making these stem cells become new oligodendrocytes. <coughs> and so now we're trying to take this research and move it from the laboratory environment and move it into the clinic. And this is going to be done with the help of <coughs> Professor Taylor, who will be talking immediately after me. And so at the moment we are planning uh, to undertake 
the very first step of moving the laboratory research into the clinic, and that is a safety trial, to make sure that this pattern of activity that we've learned can activate the OPCs is actually can be safely given to people with MS um, without having any adverse side effects or any major side effects. Um, and then the idea is that once we move through the safety trial, that this could then be moved further into efficacy trials so that we can try and determine whether or not it actually does have the potential to promote organ site generation and repair of the nervous system. So I've talked about one of the strategies that we're using at the moment and trying to use to increase um, repair of the nervous system. But actually this is the way that I really see the field has to move generally in the next decade in particular. So the last uh, few decades was a really big, um, I guess, moving point in terms of the immune part of multiple sclerosis. And I think that's made some really important impact. But I think now the next thing is going to be developing multiple strategies, not just one strategy, but multiple strategies that we can actually apply to promote nervous system health. So protect those oligodendrocytes and actually increase their replacement when they are lost. Um, and on that note, we will be hearing from Bruce. Um, for many years in the meetings, we've been very interested in what causes MS, and you all heard, and Ingrid will talk a little bit about this, our successes in that role. But now we really would like to take that a bit further and think, well, what can we do once someone has got MS to prevent them getting worse? And that doesn't only mean using drugs, it means using, it means everything in our arsenal of treatments and um, things that can be used to try to improve the lives of people with MS. And this raises a problem because MS is a difficult disease to study. Those of you in the audience who've got MS will know this. It doesn't fit the textbooks. It doesn't read the textbooks in each person. Everyone is an individual. There's a large amount of intrapersonal and interpersonal variability. Some people could be just absolutely fine and, and no problems at all. Other people have multiple issues and they can, they can change sometimes. And some people are having lots of issues and their risk can suddenly become quiescent, and vice versa. Thankfully, the latter, latter happens very rarely. But you've got to be able to study MS in a way that tells you that you've got a true association, rather than one that's just confounded by um, the people you're actually looking at. For instance, all the measure you're actually using is not accurate enough. So progression is difficult to predict. I can't tell when I first see someone and tell them, unfortunately, look, I'm sorry you've got MS, but, you know, what's the future going to hold for me? Well, I tell people a lot of times, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't see into the future. I can't tell with any individual what will happen. I can only tell when I see them five years down the track and say, yeah, you've done pretty well. You know, you've had a good problem. You've had a good course for your MS. So it's a very difficult thing to measure. And we don't measure progression very well. We, we don't have a, a, a level in the bloodstream or rhubarb, which we say is 15, that's good. 30 is bad. We don't have a marker of MS which is a reliable predictor or even in fact a yardstick for progression. So we often only can tell progression has occurred when it's happened and by that point it's often irreversible. And as I mentioned, it's highly variable. And there are mechanisms and controls or accelerants of um, progression that we don't fully understand and that's some of the things we're working on. So, <coughs> so when we talk about onset of MS, we always talk about these sort of things, infectious agents, your exposure to the Epstein-Barr virus, its environmental factors, where you live, your personal behavioural factors, if you're a smoker or not a smoker, whether you're a bit overweight in your adolescent years, how many children you've had, um, and also we talk about genetic factors. But when we talk about progression, these factors may be totally different for uh, progression. They may not be the same, and in fact, we know that some of them aren't the same. And for instance, genetic factors are likely to be very different that, under, um, that underpin progression as opposed to those who make you more likely to get the disease. And the other thing, <coughs> elephant in the room here, is um, what we do to treat people. Are the drugs we're using and giving to most people with MS, do they actually alter the long-term outcome for those people? Do they affect the accumulation of disability? Oops. So, when we're looking at someone who's got um, MS, there are a number of factors, if you like, on the seesaw of life which can affect your rate of change of the disease. 
and your genetics, all that stuff you do, vitamin D, sunlight exposure, diet, DMTs, exercise, you know, being really heavily involved in exercise, um, controlling your weight, smoking cessation, they all push that line down. Similarly, if you don't, if you've got bad genetics and bad family history, you've got your high, your BMI is increasing, you're, um, you've got a high fat diet, lack of exercise, smoking, you don't look after your comorbidities, you may swing that um, engine up and accelerate your rate of progression. This opens a lot of opportunities for being able to modify progression, which is not only by drugs. So, so what can we do to slow the progression of disability in this? Well, the first question is, do the drugs actually work? We know they reduce the risk of having an attack of MS, but we know that very, very well. We also know that it significantly reduces the rate of change of um, getting new lesions on MRI scans. So surely that means that people won't progress as fast. Well, actually, we don't know. We know that the studies that have shown to be these drugs to be effective are done that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to do so. No pharmaceutical company wants to do a 10-year study, where, and also, it's unethical if you've got people on an effective drug and you want to compare to the people who aren't on drug. These people, uh, the placebo group, are being significantly disadvantaged. So you've got these studies which last two to three years and they do provide some evidence of the effect of the EMTs. Then the drug companies will often roll these studies on and have what we call phase four studies where everyone gets a drug and everyone is watched. But they're not really as accurate in being able to tell the difference because you don't know that, the, the, um, that there's not a change in behaviour, change in um, effects of the drugs after two to three years. So, what can we do that's not drugs, non-DMT? So, important to know that when you're looking and you're hearing on the 730 report or current affair, miracle breakthrough, so-and-so has been cured from MS by, you know, being stung by bees or in a hyperbaric chamber or whatever. <laughs> Well, that's believe me, people used to have bee sting therapy. They used to give bees and they applied them to their skin to stimulate their immune system. And that was an accepted treatment for MS in the late 90s. So we now know that doesn't work, thankfully. Um, and, but there must have been 50 different treatments since I've been doing this job, which have been advocated as being the cure or definitely associated with the, you make people better with MS. And not really one of them has panned out to be true. So you've got to know that there's, you've got to actually, in MS, have consistency between studies. One study doesn't mean the end of the, you know, they prove anything really. You need to have consistency within the study. You know, if it only works in one or two people, they have a very large effect, has no benefit for these people down here. You've got to know that there's a dose response. You've got to be able to show that if I do more of it, it's better than if I do less of it. Um, you need to know the strength of the study. Is the effect size really worthwhile? Do you really want to take up running a marathon every second day to reduce your risk of progression by 5%? Probably not. You've got to know that it temporarily makes sense. So that just because something happens here and your MS changes immediately, is that true? Or is it because, you know, is it just a chance association? You've also got to, it's got to be biologically plausible. You know, really do, do we really think the drinking diet causes MS or diet, you know, those sort of things. Does it really make sense to you? And we're also going to have human experimental evidence, which is what um, Kaylee and I are looking for with this EMS. This might not work. We don't know. We want to find out. And that's why we will come out to you people with EMS in the audience and say, would you like to participate in this study? Hopefully quite won't harm you. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, we would do We have difficulty with some measures because they're very difficult to blind. It's very hard to blind physical activity because if you're in a physical activity study and they just told you, I don't do, do what you normally do, you know you're in the placebo arm. Whereas if you, you know, run a marathon every single day, you know you're probably in the active arm. <laughs> so some things are very difficult to blind. It's, it's difficult to have a long enough intervention. You really are requiring people to do a lot to maintain the studies. And some of the people in this room I see who have participated in some of our most intensive studies and sailed through them, but some of them are not easy to do. You can, however, we can get good evidence from our longitudinal studies. We can show by following people longitudinally and being, uh, using statistical techniques that we can show benefit <coughs> in, certain, in certain things. Um, 
We need to know what the kind of families of our study. If we in Tasmania enrolled everyone who's a 65 year old woman, and how can we generalise that to 23 year old men? You know, there may be a problem with age. We've got to make sure that we know everything about the people who are in the study, and we try and balance the people from getting intervention or versus the people who are not getting the intervention. So, what sort of things are important to people with MS? When you look at what people Google, they are very interested in things such as diet. They're very interested in cannabis. I don't know whether that's the treat for MS or not. Um, <laughs> they're interested in exercise. The drugs will be used are well down the list. So we are, we're also interested to know what people are interested in, what they'd like us to be able to study as well, because it does inform us as well, because people have a, a very strong views in, in, on what, what makes them better and what makes them worse. For instance, let's talk about one thing that we know is very bad for MS, and that's smoking. We know that if you smoke, you do worse with MS, if you're taking everything into account. But what we don't know, for instance, is does stopping make a difference? Or are those people who are smoking got a whole lot of other things that go along with the smoking which make the MS worse? We can show that it's likely to be a, 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 a something that makes your MS worse. And we obviously tell people to stop smoking. But actually, the evidence is saying that stopping smoking might be suddenly turn your MS progression around. It's not there. Similarly, we know from our work here that lipids having a bad lipid profile in, and also having overweight is, a, is associated with a worse outcome in MS. People progress faster if they have those things. But then again, conversely, we don't know that making those people's lipids better and getting to lose weight reverses that or changes their trajectory. So there's a lot of work to still be done there. And these are associations, they're not causations that we can prove the water and changing that or offering that we can make people better. We've been very interested in sunlight and vitamin D for many years, as you know, in some of the people have heard this and nausea. But when you look at vitamin D levels and EDSS, which is a measure of um, uh, EDS progression, vitamin, lower vitamin D is associated with a fast rate of EDSS progression. But that may be one of the biggest bugbears we have in these studies is reverse causality because low vitamin D is also associated with increased disability. Therefore, you may have the low vitamin D purely because you're disabled, not because it is driving your disability. And we've attempted to um, understand that, whether vitamin D or sunlight can affect your risk of progression in MS. We looked at people with very early MS in what we call the Oslong study, which followed people after their first attack. And we looked at those who changed their behaviours after they were diagnosed with an event which may be their first measure of MS. And we found that those up here who changed their behaviour and increased their sunlight exposure had a lower risk of going on and having their second event and converting to MS. Whereas those who um, decreased their sunlight exposure had a greater risk of going on. Similarly, when we looked at their, um, when ones that actually got MS, those who changed their behaviour to having more sunlight exposure, and that's one to um, also hours a day, more than one, greater than one hour a day, and a significantly lower chance of um, having relapses. So we think that sunlight may have, and, lo and conversely those who reduced their sun exposure, did much worse. Now this we mentioned before the event, therefore we don't have a problem with reverse causality. So this may be a real effect, this may tell us there's something you can do behaviourally after your attack of MS, which may alter your risk of having subsequent attacks. So, what about diet? Diet is something number one in our thing. We may think it's already all been answered. You can go out and buy any number of books on the subject, all of which tell you to use a different diet. So that's always a new consistency between studies is not here with diet. And none of them really actually have any true scientific underlying underpinnings behind them. You know, it's like the paleo diet is good for everything. You know, this diet, you know, the wall diet is, you know, is one that's very common thing. But when you see that there's at least five or six books that I can find in two minutes on the subject, and all of them say something different, it tells you there's probably no consistency here. So, it's very difficult area of research diet. People lie about what they eat all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and to date, there's been no dietary intervention which has been shown to significantly alter MS course. 
We are very interested in, in this year of the events, and it's going to be a major focus over the next few years to try to be able to understand how do I, with our national and international collaborators, how do I, and how narcos and diet can significantly influence your risk of getting uh, or progressing with MS. But the jury is still out, and I always tell people that there's no harm in having a sensible, healthy diet in MS, but don't go to an extreme. You know, don't, you don't need to torture yourself with your diet. If you go to McDonald's every day, or you know, you're not going to do as well. But if you have a sensible diet, which everyone knows what it is, and largely follow that, you'll do yourself no harm. <coughs> so, so, in summary, in this progression is difficult to measure. The drivers may be different between those factors which are associated with onset. Drivers of the inflammatory component, which is may be different from those that underlie neurodegeneration. And that's a major issue, which is a whole other hour of sport. We may be able to answer some of these studies from well done longitudinal cohort studies, which we're doing here at UMS. And there's an awful lot to learn about this. But can we actually alter it? Of actually, we still don't know. We, we, we think we could be doing a job, and when we look retrospectively, and when I look back over the 30 years or so that I've been looking at people with MS, I don't think people in this generation are doing as badly as the people I first started looking after in the 1990s, and I think that that's probably true. Um, it's very likely to be an effect of DMT, so I think that's really important. I think that you know, we are starting to get that evidence that we have, we have made a difference to people's lives by using these drugs, and I think it's really important. Diet, non-pharmacological treatments are really important and really something we'd like to study more. Diet is of particular interest, but it's very difficult to assess. Our current focus is to try to be able to translate these findings and discoveries that we've made and into practice in a much more rapid um, and manner than we have in the past. And we want to be able to take out our diet idea, be able to put it out and get it out into the real world, get it out to clinical practice, improve the lives of people with MS here locally and nationally, internationally. And we think we can do that. That's going to be the focus of our research over the next five years. This is where um, this is a timeline of various treatments. And if you look here, this is um, really where I started coming into the world here. And we had no treatment when I started. There was no active treatment for MS. We started getting treatment about 1996. We became available in Australia with Peter Field and Avidex and Copaxa. We've now got all of these drugs. It's now become incredibly complicated. To know how to treat people with MS is, is not an easy thing any longer. And we're getting more drugs on the, these drugs are on the horizon here. They're going to be in Australia soon, this one in particular. When we're using this drug to treat so it's a vitamin to treat progressive MS. We, we're very interested in the question of does stem cell transplant make a difference to people with very aggressive MS? But the risk of that procedure is very high. We've got all this work to do and we're hoping to that over the next 10 years, that what's happened in this past 20 years of studying back from a disease which we call the mystery illness, and we said, well, can't do anything about that, to something we can actively treat. Now we're looking at it far more holistically, and we're now looking at trying to try and make more discoveries about prevention of MS. So, those of you standing on the, looking at it over the rest of this, we hope we can pull you back from that. Thank you. <laughs> Because they've got it right. 
Now there's a shift to actually say, oh, well, what did the patient actually perceive? Um, so that's kind of a, a, a good way of, of looking at it, at it as well. So then ultimately, on to shift to interventions. Uh, interventions that improve patients' outcomes and then move that towards translation. And I will talk about that a little bit later as well. So I see MS as, as puzzles within puzzles. Um, it's 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 one mass, massive puzzle, and, and you know I was thinking and reflecting on, on what is my contribution to this puzzle um, because you know I've got so many different areas as well, epidemiology, immunology, psychology, neuroscience, genetics, and we go on, and you know we've got a team now together which is absolutely fantastic with so many different facets covered. Um, but at the end of the day, every one of us can only fix a few little puzzle pieces and put few little puzzle, puzzle pieces on the table and sometimes they don't fit. Sometimes they're really small and, and quite often they don't make a difference to the, to the people with MS at this point in time and hopefully later down the track they will. Um, so the lines of the puzzles of research that I'm working on is progressive MS, uh, employment and work productivity, and healthy lifestyles, comorbidities and then translating your evidence into practice. So the progressive MS puzzle is uh, one that's really high on the table at the moment. Progressive onset MS, about 10% of people have the progressive onset type. Uh, so most of the research in the past, all of our studies have focused on everybody, all people with MS. And we've come up with some beautiful factors, uh, known risk factors, smoking, sun bar virus, low sun exposure, uh, some genetic factors, and in one of my papers I calculated that around 64% can be explained by those known risk factors. So that's one piece in the puzzle that we've solved over the last 10, 15 years. So that's a fantastic achievement. <coughs> and also, we now have around 40 treatments, as Bruce was saying, for relapsing remitting MS. Fantastic pieces in the puzzle. But at the moment, there's no treatment, that, there's a lack of treatment for progressive MS, only one of them is available. So, <coughs> last year or the year before, they called the big international progressive alliance together um, to, to actually have a big investment around progressive MS. So, we also thought, well, what can we do? Um, so, what we know is that the latitudinal gradient is nearly absent. So, we know for MS, there's a strong latitudinal gradient, but interestingly enough, this is some of Bruce's days. For people with progressive onset and their state, there's no latitude on gradient. What does that mean? Does that mean that low sun exposure is not important? I don't know, we're going to find out. Um, the sex ratio is closer to one. Um, so in MS, it's mostly women that have MS, but that's really only for relapsing onset MS. The onset is about nine years later. The disability progression is faster, and but the genetics is pretty similar. So what else can we do? Um, so I've conducted a, a primary progressive MS study where we recruited a, a whole number of cases, people with primary progressive MS, and we asked them about their whole life, lots of factors, um, and we will compare that to people that don't have MS. So that. Um, Studies, field work has just been done, so that has been cleaned, and over the next few years, uh, information will come out of that study. We then enrolled these people in the Australian as longitudinal study that I run, and then we're going to follow them long term, and then we can, we can see which factors are associated with the progression as well. So, to start with, we already had some data on, on these people, and one of my students has been <coughs> looking at this, uh, comparing. <coughs> Um, those with the progressive onset type to the relapse onset type in terms of patient reported outcomes. And what we found is that the patient reported outcomes were far worse for the progressive onset MS than compared to the relapse onset, and particularly early in the disease. And you can see that here with the orange bars being quite a bit higher, particularly early on. So it means these people straight away have quite severe symptoms. And after that, they still progress a little bit, but not as much as those with the relapsing. They can relapse and slowly catch it up a little bit. Um, so that really means we have to intervene early. Because if we want to make a difference, we have to do it early. So this one of research will progress over the next couple of years. So in terms of employment and work productivity, um, what we know about the cost of MS, it costs Australia about one million a year. 
<coughs> and about half of that is due to indirect costs due to the fact that people retire early. So a loss of income. Um, so why do people work? Financial security. But in addition to that, it's, it's, a, it's a big part of your identity, it's purpose, it's your reason to get up. It's important for socialization and your benefit to others. So there's a lot of, a lot of benefits to, to, to working. But to work when you have a disease like MS is, a, is also an additional burden and you have to balance those two. So one of the things that we've found <coughs> is that the employment gap has actually substantially reduced uh, over the last years from 14.3% to 3.5%. So at the moment, um, in the general population, about 61% is in the labor force, and people with MS, 57.8. So that difference is a lot smaller now than it was before, which is really fantastic. And we have some evidence that that might actually partly be due to the, to the disease-modifying therapies. Um, and there's no gap for women anymore. <coughs> the age of retirement has increased from 52 years to 57 years. So that's also a really nice positive story. But most people still retire because of their MS, not because of old age or an older reason. 73% of men retire because of their MS and 90% of men. The other thing we've really had is work productivity. So when you are working, how productive are you? And do you miss a lot, of, a lot of days because you cannot work? So we know that there is some loss of product, work productivity. We've measured how much that is. And we found that, that it's mostly driven by um, the symptoms. Fatigue, pain, sensory symptoms, walking difficulties. So basically that highlights the, the need to, to improve the, the symptom management. So that's where Amos Work Smart comes in. That's one of my, my little dreams that, that slowly turns into reality. Some of the projects start really slowly before they get momentum. Um, so this is an online self-management program with telephone support accessible on different devices. So what I'd like to achieve is that, that MS WorkSmart basically guides a person with MS through modules, quizzes, videos, homework activities, um, and they get learning strategies that they can apply to, the, to, to their lives. Um, and we do that together with people with MS and, and other stakeholders because it needs to be as practical as possible and as useful as possible. And the aspects that are covered, we're sort of looking at <coughs> personal coping behaviours and strategies for problem-focused coping. Uh, people learn about unhelpful thoughts and how that influences their behaviour. Um, because they learn to assess their, their own personal needs in the workplace. Um, it talks about assertiveness training, how do you communicate with your employer and your colleagues when you have a disease like MS. And it provides information and assistance around supports. So at the moment we're only in the development phase and then we're going to shift to the feasibility study to demonstrate that we can actually do an intervention. And we need to get the money to actually do that intervention to demonstrate the effectiveness because there's no point if it's not effective to, to roll this out in Australia. If we can show the effectiveness, then we start rolling it out in Australia. So yeah, a little while to go, but that's, <coughs> that's one of my last projects. The other one that, that I really like, another technology type project, is INFORMS. It's like a new patient-driven healthcare model for MS. Um, it's an electronic patient portal, um, and it's creating a personal health record where we put the patient in charge of their data. Um, we want to visualise the data, so we're using data from the AMSLS, the Australian Earth Longitudinal Study, so they've given us a whole lot of data. <coughs> now we give them back to them and say, so let's visualise that data for them. So we can visualise the symptoms, we can visualise the disability data that they've given us, or the data that they've given us. Um, so we can track people over time and we can compare their outcomes to other people. And we allow them to share their data with health professionals. So they can put their teams together, give it to the physio, give it to neurologists. And we can link it to all the health databases, like a clinical neurologist database, and it's called MS Base. Oh, that's a bit extreme. <laughs> Do that. <coughs> and we can add to that as well, potentially by, by hanging apps 
on that as well. Um, there are now symptom tracker apps available. So if people want to use that, that data could potentially be uploaded. Um, we're only in the developing st the development stage at the moment, but it's, it's quite exciting and um, we'll, we'll see where we, where we get with that. In terms of healthy lifestyles, Bruce was already touching on it. One of the things we've looked at was stressful life events and some interesting findings around positive stressful life events. They're actually really good for you, not surprisingly. But we really found a signal with uh, a reduced risk of relapses. Um, and we also found that negative stressful life events uh, really increased feelings of anxiety and depression. So if there's something good that you can do, it's have a really nice, nice lifestyle and avoid all those, uh, those bad things and do lots of, lots of heavy things. Um, the other things we're looking at is nutrition and, and <coughs> the diets that people are using, physical activity, some exposure vitamin D, and, and we ask people themselves, what do you do to improve your MS, to actually learn from what, what people do out there? Um, so this is one of the surveys we're currently analysing, um, which is starting to analyse. So the Australian MS Longitudinal Study, we're basically tracking people over time, we're giving them surveys, about three survey rounds each year, um, and it's incredibly valuable data that we get out of that. So the last part is translating evidence into, into, uh, evidence into practice. So it's kind of a new, internationally unique direction that we're taking. Uh, kind of a bold move, as, as Kayleen will say later in one of the videos that we will, that we will show you. Um, but the idea is that we have an integrated approach that brings researchers, policy makers and those who deliver care and services together for the purpose of improving practice and policy based on the latest research. Um, quite often as researchers, we do all our research, we publish it and that's where we stop. So now we want to take an extra step further and say, okay, let's work together with the people who put it out there in practice and don't leave it up to them to do it because we have skills that they can use, they have skills that we can use, so let's work together. So we want to create something that we might call an MS translation centre or an MS evidence centre, or if an angle we'll come up with. So the parts are kind of to, to review the evidence first, systematic reviews on topics that directly benefit patient health. Uh, we want to create information, videos, or systems that put the evidence into practice. We then want to roll that out um, with stakeholders to implement that evidence <coughs> into practice. And then we want to measure as well whether the rollout actually made a difference. Because if we do all this stuff and it doesn't make a difference, well, we might as well stop. <coughs> so that is kind of the, the idea that we have in terms of translating uh, evidence and, and evidence that's out there at the moment. It's not necessarily our evidence that we're creating, but everything that's out there in the, in the, big, the big world. And it kind of falls under a flagship program. Um, <coughs> our director, Alison Venn, and the board decided it was useful to have some flagship projects. And she basically nominated MS to be the first flagship project, which is incredibly exciting for us and offers some great opportunities. Um, and a little bit later, we'll, we'll show a video around that MS flagship project. So it's a massive collaborative effort um, where we need to pull together many, many people. And you know, we work with people with MS, we've got our own team, but we work together with the national and international research collaborators. We work together with our key stakeholders, MS Research Australia, MS Australia, the societies, and all the key bodies. And hopefully together, we'll make a big difference over the next 10 years. Thank you. I live with the challenge of MS each and every day. Um, I live, live in Alveston, our Sunshine Coast. It's sunnier up there today than down in Hobart Town. And being Tasmanian born, as we know, I'm absolutely four times more likely to be diagnosed with MS and seven times more likely to be born in North Queensland. Um, September 13, 1989. So before all 
Prior to all the disease-modifying drugs, I was diagnosed with MS. I was 23. Jane and I had just started a home mortgage. Interest rates were 17.5%. And I was diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS. It's a little while ago. It's a long while ago. Um, but I distinctly remember the fear, the anxiety, and the emotion we both and our families felt at this particular time. Um, my symptoms I was experiencing at the time were double vision or diplopia, and I had a numb finger and thumb. Um, it's today 27 years, 11 months, three days, and nine and a half hours since my diagnosis. One never forgets. Six months post-diagnosis, I lost sensation and control in the lower half of my body and subsequently needed to use a wheelchair. Um, through some hard work, some very good luck and good fortune, and I gradually walked again and have since regained, obviously, much capacity. Um, coming to terms and accepting my not-so-perfect body, I was a young bloke, our journey has been one of significant challenge. Similar to most of us living with MS, my apprenticeship, if you like, did mean it took us a couple of years to come to terms with the challenges it presented, both psychologically and emotionally, uh, for us all, as it is, as we know, an insidious, lifelong and ongoing disease. Over the almost 28 years my MS has progressed and I've continued to uh, experience and have episodic diplopia or double vision. I certainly experience the fatigue, I have tremor, I've sensory loss in both my hands and other parts of my body, I'm heat and humidity intolerance, and this is the third time this year I've worn trousers because you're important people, I usually wear shorts. <laughs> I also experience episodic neurological pain, I have vertigo and I'm daily challenged with incontinence. I also have interesting hand-eye coordination skill level. Um, I'm anticipating this is because of my MS. We have an interesting eclectic collection of crockery at home, mostly chipped and cracked, and I'm the noisiest damaging person in the world in the future. Throughout the past 28 years, for a number of reasons, and you've been witness to the range of medications that you can have today, um, I've been through multiple symptom exacerbations and a range of medication regimes. This has included a two year period of chemotherapy and I've injected lots of things in my body, all prescription drugs, for the past 20 years. Quite a few years ago now, uh, while undergoing not only chemotherapy, this was then at the time was the only particular drug that was intended to slow the progression of my ongoing MS, and also dealing with the ever increasing variety of my MS exacerbations, saw me as dad at home uh, with our two young daughters, who at that time were two and five. I wasn't well enough to even think about going to work, so Jane did. Um, and combined with the MS, my treatment, and the impact on this uh, relatively substantial and, uh, treatment regime, uh, I can say today that uh, the kids survived, um, as did our marriage. And our daughters are now both residents of the uh, mainland, or Big Island, that's got nothing to do with MS, it's purely just direction by virtue of their career. Uh, one who's recently graduated forensic scientist, and the other one's halfway through her degree. New medications, as we've uh, been, have been shared tonight, and treatments in Australia have assisted me group to regain and maintain much improved health. And I'm now able to work part-time, I've done this for the past 13 years. One of the many things we, the MS community, and I know and see a lot of people that I do know who live with MS, as I do, uh, experience and share the idiosyncratic nature of the wide range of symptoms, particularly the hidden nature of some of these. It often reminds me of my past when I'm looking and feeling quite well. Um, I do recall 36 years ago, my father, who I know is in the audience, and I'm not going to look at you as I talk about your dad, but when I left the Northwest Coast 36 years ago to join the Navy, he gave me two pieces of advice. One was, don't disgrace the family name. <laughs> and I said back then, I won't, I'll use someone else's name. <laughs> His other piece of advice was, don't ever judge a book by its cover. And I've probably taken more notice of this over the years. It's very much and possibly only those in my MS family in the audience will appreciate and resonate with that sometimes with endearing and enduring comment we receive from our loved ones, you look so well. We may look so well, but we might feel like 
<laughs> I've been a loud and vocal personality and a noisy one since my beginning, apparently, and this I continue to be. I've been a national advocate for MS Australia since 2008, and three years ago I was appointed as the national advocacy coordinator for the country. I have a team of national advocates, they're all volunteers, they all live with MS, or their spouse or partner or significant other lives with MS. And we as a team work collaboratively as part of MS Australia on systemic advocacy in key areas. I also co-chair Tasmania's MS Advisory Council to MS Limited, along with Viv Jones, who I know is in the audience tonight. And we provide advice to them to their board of directors. We do have a number of those council members present with us tonight, and I thank you very much for your great contribution to Tasmania's uh, community and to those in Tasmania that share our journey living with MS. Apparently some of the guys I have heard whispers that are here tonight to throw tomatoes at one of their co-chairs. We throw them at Viv, Viv and I hope they're organic tomatoes, guys. <laughs> Systemic advocacy, my national advocates and I from throughout the country achieve through a range of activities. Some include developing and maintaining professional relationships with our federal members of parliament, senators, key staff and political policy makers. We present to parliamentary inquiries. We sit on a broad range of committees and working parties. We participate in political issue-based campaigns, media events, and we use social media also positively to perpetuate our cause and agenda. We as a team are ambitious, professional, strategic, and absolutely committed to ensure we are, the MS community, all profiled. As we live our lives, we are the aim of achieving our fullest possible potential and capacity each and every day. No matter our circumstance, the DMS is and continues to be maintained on a political radar throughout Australia nationally. I've been asked to talk a little about my journey, journey of World Oceans of Hope a couple of years ago. It's one of the many highlights I've been fortunate to experience in my role as National Advocacy Coordinator. Uh, September 30, 2014, I was at a staff meeting in Sydney. And it happened to be my birthday, so I was, a bit, I was in Sydney on my birthday because I usually take that off. But I heard about, at the meeting, our staff meeting, that uh, about Oceans of Hope, a 67 foot long yacht from Denmark with a working crew of people like myself with MS that were seeking to navigate the globe and they were needing crew. Spontaneously, I did some research on this and discovered the objective of the circumnavigation was to change perception globally of what is possible when people with chronic disease like myself are empowered to conquer their individual challenges. They do this through responsibility and commitment, apparently, and I discovered sailing around the world is just that. It requires hard work, commitment, and absolutely a dependency on each other, all working as a team. Oceans of Hope is a 67, a Challenge 67. She was built in 1996 for the BT Global Challenge to sail around the world the, world the wrong way against the prevailing winds and currents. The yacht's 20 metres long, built out of steel. Prior to being Oceans of Hope, she was based in Spain, where she undertook scientific and educational expeditions throughout the globe under the name Pakia Bitskia, and interestingly, Pakia means peace in Basque. Following quite a substantial process, application process, including neurological and psychological assessment, my application was successful. Okay. To sail from Auckland to Sydney, and actually sailing to Sydney Harbour to celebrate World MS Day in May 2015. Best birthday bonus I had for a couple of years. Um, I was rather excited about it and thought I could put forward a proposal to extend my experience aboard Ocean Folk to not only include sailing from Auckland to Sydney, but continue aboard her across the entire Australian leagues, if I was so bold. My spin, being the terrific publicity, someone like myself in the capacity I had with MS Australia, would be able to absolutely extend uh, the marketing and promotion of MS and what is capable of, of being with MS around the country if I were able to do that. Interestingly, this was accepted. And so for 63 days, 63 days I sailed with three different crews from Auckland to Sydney to Cairns and on to Darwin. The Oceans of Hope project had its aim being to educate, inspire and motivate those living with MS. Rather, and sailing to be an opportunity to open doors and challenge the feeling that sometimes you have when you're faced with the challenging and idiosyncratic nature of living with a condition like MS. Dr. Michael Antonison, a specialist at Copenhagen University Hospital in Denmark, is the founder of Sailing Sclerosis Foundation. 
He's a doctor, a psychotherapist and a sailor. He had an experience with a client who was a blacksmith, diagnosed with MS, used to sail, had some depression. Nickel convinced him to go sailing again. And following that, Nickel believed that uh, there would be some benefit in opening that door of opportunity for people throughout the world. That has seen large groups of people from the entire world sailing around the globe, all living with MS. As Oceans of Hope commenced its circumnavigation in Denmark in June 2014, it stopped in numerous port cities in Europe, crossed the North Atlantic, and was the centrepiece of the 2014 Ectrams Conference in Boston, where the yacht and the crew were presented to 9,000 international attendees. And that's what I heard about it. Following that, Oceans of Hope visited Germany, the UK, France, the US, Jamaica, Panama, French Polynesia, Samoa, Tonga, Auckland, finally Australia, and then Singapore. In Singapore, she was loaded onto a container ship, transported to Turkey, interestingly to avoid piracy off Africa, and, as well as the monsoon season in the Arabian Sea. She then returned to European waters, sailing the Mediterranean, to be in Barcelona for the next Ectrams conference, where the crew and the opera presented in 2015. Following this, she then sailed back to Italy, then to the North Sea and back to Copenhagen in November that year. The yacht did take 17 months to circumnavigate the globe. It sailed 33,000 nautical miles or 61,000 kilometres, equivalent to 15 times between Sydney and Perth. It is with great and immense gratification, and also with some humility, I share this my reflection of some of my experiences aboard. Uh, I live the wonder of sailing from Auckland to Sydney, to Newcastle, to Southport, to Fraser Island, Hamilton Island, Mackay, Cairns, Thursday Island, and Darwin. With this, I missed a substantial winter period in Tasmania, as luck would have it. Coldest winter since 1966. Coldest winter since and coldest winter night since 1995 and overnight temperatures down to minus 2.2. My body took a hit the day I flew home in July from Darwin. It was 32 and five hours later it was five degrees in Alveston when I arrived home. <laughs> this amazing sailing opportunity I thoroughly and wholeheartedly enjoyed. I met and cruised with some amazing people, all folk living with MS from around the world. I shared my experiences with people living from the US, Denmark, Austria, Iceland, Belgium, New Zealand and Australia. There was no confusion over whether they were born in New Zealand or Australia, we didn't know that many times. <laughs> all great people, the MS family are, with history of their own and all of whom I now share an interesting relationship or a special friendship with as members of the Relations of Hope crew family. My entire journey certainly taught me much about human spirit, commitment, determination, grace, courage and reward. I was also ex had the experience of pr provision of taster sailing opportunities for folk uh, as we sailed in Auckland, Sydney, Newcastle, Southport, Cairns and Darwin. At these locations we took other folk with MS, mostly folk that had progressive MS or were not as, had, had the function capacity that I currently have, uh, to sample and experience the joy of sailing. Uh, this was a rather emotional, powerful and rewarding experience to say the least. The joy of sailing was to behold, laughter, smiles, etc. all became wrong for us, and for me, I think that was the highlight of the journey. Whilst on my journey, the average media coverage stimulated and showcased the MS across our nation equated to one article every 48 hours through, throughout the entire 63 days I was sailing. I'm really proud of that achievement, because that was the skin I put in my application to say I would achieve if they gave me a good to go for 63 days. I worked 58 of the 63 days of the Oceans of Hope, three days on, uh, sorry, three hours on, six hours off around the clock, each and every one of these days. I'm very now much excited for the next chapter of this boat, as more lives are changed, as more people from around the globe have an association with and continue to be moved by this very strong and powerful medium. I wanted to make sure the Oceans of Hope journey didn't finish just in 2015, and we at MS Australia wanted to see there be at least a lasting legacy. I thought the best way to do this would be by evaluating the voyage outcomes and putting some scientific rigour around the anecdotes and the stories that emerged before, during and after the journey. 
We hooked up with some researchers at another university and some of their honours students are about to submit their theses, which explore the online narratives, including my own, uh, of the oceans of hope, global circumnavigation. And their findings will be published later this year, so watch this space. I'm sure I'll talk about it when they're out. If you're in the audience and you happen to be someone who may need information or you've been recently diagnosed and joined the family, my absolute recommendation to you is to always source accurate and relevant information. As we all know, information is power. I've always been someone who enjoys great service, no matter for, for what or from whom. I have a well established and a great relationship with my GP, my MS nurse and my neurologist. <laughs> The easiest and most expedient pathway for support service today in Tasmania is through MS Limited and their MS Connect option. This is their gateway to living well with MS and MS Connect, provide, Connect provides information and advice and links you into supports and services. And this includes information about MS, support for people that are newly diagnosed, expert advice on managing your symptoms, it links you into MS education programs and provides you extra support for you and your family and it may connect you to others also living with MS. It acts as a referral service as well and it may well assist you interpret what the NDIS may well mean for you. If you need their number, I have it. It's 1800 042 138. You can talk to me afterwards. I'm not spruiking it, but if you need support, this is the option you have in Tasmania right now. Now, as I grow, as I mature, as I age gracefully or not, and plan for whatever my future may well be, research suddenly has become a little more important for me. Also important for my 850,000 fellow Australians and their families living with neurodegenerative disease. I am and happen to be one of the 23,000 folks living with MS in Australia. And a cure for me alone would mean the range of symptoms I experience each and every day the buckets of medication and treatment regimes I consume and inject, the limitations my MS journey is meant for not only myself but my family would reduce and my contribution to Australia's economy had, would have the potential to be and could be so much greater. Research, thank goodness, is the only way to reduce the number of people who are diagnosed and they need this support. Greater investment is needed in research, certainly not only to reduce the economic burden in this country but also to improve our futures. I'm a husband, a father, a son, a friend, a political agitator, I'm an advocate, but I'm also now, as you just know, just another Australian living with MS. And I maintain I treat MS with both the respect and sometimes the contempt it's deserving of. I believe and know if I continue if I can and continue to be a vehicle for positive political and social change. And I can, as the Menzies has, and undoubtedly will continue to do over the next decade, actively contribute and extensively research MS, as they've shared tonight. I, along with them, ultimately very much look forward to the day when MS is as speculated, not for all, but for most, a well-managed chronic condition with medications. And who knows, during this time, fingers crossed, science, science may well discover a cure. I, along with the Menzies, should this be the case, will have so contributed and completed and provided a productive and valuable contribution to this country, I'm sure. But to finish on a lighter note, apparently more people actually climb Mount Everest each year than sail across the Tasman Sea, and I bloody well know what they. <laughs> I experienced the 10 metre seas, there were 12 actually, I've corrected my notes, and the 50 knot winds. And the warm beer, for someone who doesn't drink beer when we got into Neutral Bay in Sydney, was the best beer for a long beer drinker ever. So, <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew, for being with us here at Menzies today. We really appreciate it, especially wearing the pants. <laughs> but sincerely, we really appreciate the efforts you're making to be a part of our team at Menzies as we progress our research. So now I'd like to ask our four speakers to join us up here on stage, and we do have time for, for some questions. The lady here in the front. I'm not sure who I, how I address this to, but I've heard no information about the inheritance, if at all, on MS. Oh, I guess that's my field. Um, 
So, uh, MS is partially heritable. Um, about 25% of your risk is from your genes. It's not a disease like cystic fibrosis where you need a bad gene from both the mother or father. It's, a, it's what we call a polygenic disorder, which means that there are now 237 different genes within the genome which contribute to your risk of MS. Having each of those genes only contributes a small risk um, and therefore it's not the sort of disease where it's very, you know, we see that it's commonly inherited um, down at the line. It is more common amongst first degree relatives, but about 25% of your risk comes from your genes. Next question, or any other questions? Please. Right, with the um, increased incidence in the southern latitudes, compared to North Queensland. Has there ever been any research that looked at how long have either you or your forebears lived in those climates? Does it make a difference if you form here and then you move up there? Oh, yeah, sorry, so I'm to be holding this. Yes, there's been a lot of work which shows that where you live is very important and what time of your life you live there is also very important. If you're born, it's not some, you, you inherit the genetic risk from your parents and that contributes to your risk, but the, your, it's, your risk of getting in this is modified by living in that environment. So if you live in Queensland and you move to Tasmania before the age of 15, as I just often stated, you'll get the risk, you'll get the risk of where you have moved to. If you move after the age of 15, you, you'll retain the risk of living in Queensland. Similarly, if you move from Tasmania to Queensland before the age of 15, your risk goes down. But after the age of 15, you, you, you bear the scars of being a Tasmanian. <laughs> <laughs> we can make Tasmanian jokes. <laughs> Just those mainlanders that can't. <laughs> Any other questions from our audience tonight? Up, uh, Just up the back here. Thanks, thanks ever so much. Um, <clears throat> uh, Bruce knows who I am. Um, I just want, uh, I, I want to talk to the, to the employment component of it. Um, thanks. <laughs> One of the interesting aspects, uh, and Bruce and I have discussed this with regards to MS, is whether and to what extent, and you touched on it, uh, individuals with MS are exited from the work from the workforce earlier than they should be, earlier than is possible. To what extent might it be possible to um, put in place information programs for employers, or do research that that informs employers so that they can support staff with MS and ensure that they're able to work for as long as possible and make the best contribution to the economy? Yeah, you you would have noticed MS work smarts tackles the, the people that have MS. We, we believe we can make the biggest difference by working with the people with MS. Um, there is, however, an employer on that, on that other end. We're, we're actually hoping within the MS Work Smart to develop some materials as well for the employers. Uh, to develop a video to start with that even explains what is MS. People have trouble saying that as well. So to have an enlightening video that, that tells the diversity of it and, and gives some, some examples of, of how people feel. Um, but yeah, some resources for employees are, are absolutely very critical. And the people I work with um, uh, at Monash, they're actually from the, from the business department and they're coming from the employee perspective. So they have a big interest from, from that perspective. So yeah, it's, uh, it's an important part that we will focus on. Can I just say that um, Andrew made a very important comment there that, you know, when he was saying that it's, when you look at him, apart from not having any socks, he looks, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he looks fine. But internally, you know, MS is, has got a lot of lived symptoms which only the person can experience. You can't measure things like fatigue or you know, neuropathic pain or you know, the cognitive, you know, some of the cognitive things people suffer from, humidity and problems. They're not measurable. You can't put a number on them. And employees find that very hard to understand. 
and therefore what, that's why we need advocates and people who, with MS who can explain what it is like to live with MS and to try and work and how the environment can be improved. And that's something that we think is really important to improve the quality of lives of people with MS. <coughs> sorry, sorry, give me a hard time. <laughs> we can probably just take one more question if there's anybody up in the back corner. But, but before I take this last question, let me mention to people who do have other questions, Miranda will be here at the end. And, and if you want to write them down and leave them with her, then she'll pass them on to the right member of the team. Or of course, you can, men you can email the Menzies um, email address and we'll put you in contact with the right person. Please. My name is Abed. I think uh, you tapped on a couple of times about the diet. Uh, I thought maybe if uh, Andrew can share with us his uh, experience, if he's got any uh, experience about diet, something I find it's uh, kind of health. Can you hear me? Okay. I looked straight at Jane, my wife, a minute ago because she's my diet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Tried lots of things over the years and absolutely concur with uh, the statement of Bruce Lowe that there are so many cures in the world. So lots of books out there and they all contradict each other and say different things. Um, we have a pretty conservative, um, healthy, nutritious diet. Um, I grew up on a farm where we had lots of potatoes, lots of red meats and all the rest of it. My wife has probably been the most positive influence in my life as far as diet goes. And our, our diet now, lots of fresh, green, low meat, not extreme, lots of exercise within the limitations I have. Um, but it's not, it's pretty conservative, but it's not over the top. Um, but it's exercise, good diet, lifestyle, work minimising, it's a whole range of things, not just the diet. But yeah, I've tried all the weird and wonderful cures, and some of them you just throw. <laughs> they don't work. So, and some are good for some people, for a lot of reasons, and others not. But that's just lots of leafy green, low red meat. That's been my experience. That's right for me. It may not be right for another person. Thanks for that. So we'll call a, call a close to the questions, and we're coming to the end of the evening. The last thing I wanted to say tonight, for those of you who might be new to us at Menzies, if you'd like to join our mailing list, there's an opportunity to do that as you leave the, the, um, the lecture theatre this evening. But please join me in thanking the speakers. And then before we leave tonight, I'm going to show you a, a brief movie that we've put together here at Menzies that's really drawing together some of the research that you've heard tonight. And we use it to try and put out there to the rest of the world, to our international collaborators, to our funding bodies, the opportunities that really exist here at Menzies with our MS research. It's an aspirational video, it's really showcasing the research that we're doing here and where we want to take it, which is of course to make a difference to people who have MS. So please join me in thanking our speakers tonight. I first started treating people with MS as a doctor 25 years ago, we had no treatment. Well, we've had a history of more than 20 years of research in MS now, so we can bring together that experience of, of 20 years and the successes we've had to date. We need to draw in all the key people because we can't do things just by ourselves. We don't have all the expertise. We need to entice people to, to be, become part of us. If we really want to be able to move these things really rapidly from the lab and genetic discoveries all the way through to new treatments that are actually improving people's lives, then we need more investment in MS research. And that's where I think we, we are in a very unique position. And that's often hardest to be when you're first on the, you know, you sort of cab off the rank to get that moving further. Business as usual in medical research achieves quite a bit. 
And I'm confident that if we did business as usual, we would continue to achieve and make a contribution. This is the turbocharger. We've played a key role to here, and I was stretching it out to the, to the next phase, and that's what I'm excited about. It's the first time it's been done in the world. It's a really bold move for Australia, and it's a remarkably bold move for MS Research internationally. To play that big role internationally and to engage with all these people, I think we're well placed to make a big difference for people with MS. The thing that I'm always trying to achieve is a cure for the disease. If we could cure MS, that is, I mean, that has to be the goal. I think ultimately the aim is that we make a difference in the lives of people with MS. That, that has to be our, our goal. It's big, yes. If it works, it's going to be huge.